All right, so now I'm going to start the official presentation that will be video recorded for YouTube. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Pest Management in Vegetable Gardens. I'm Ann Shellman, the UCCE Master Gardener Coordinator for Stanislaus County, and I'm excited to have you here today to talk all about managing pests in vegetable gardens. A little bit about me, I went to school some time ago for horticulture at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, and since uh, my, before my time there, I've worked at nurseries and I've always been involved somehow with gardening or pests. So that's a little bit about me, Ro, over to you. Hello, so nice to meet everyone today. I'm Ro and I'm a master gardener for Stanislaus County and I have been gardening, it seems like all my life, uh, sometimes very successfully and sometimes not too great. So tonight we're gonna talk about or today we're going to talk about something very close to my heart, all those little pests that are in the garden. And uh, it seems like I'm always very good at finding them. So uh, I love to grow vegetables. Um, it doesn't make any difference if it's one tomato plant or if it's several, but it's so much fun. So let's get started. We have a busy agenda today. Almost, okay. We're gonna talk about pest management and IPM. I hate using those, those initials, but we'll talk about that if you're not familiar. Oh, look at, there, look at my, there's a friend there right on the screen. Principles of IPM, common garden pest problems, less toxic management tips, and that less toxic is real important. And we'll answer questions along the way and we'll have a couple of, of pop quizzes and everyone gets a hundred, I'm sure. Uh, so let's start about the IPM, which is the way that we talk about the integrated pest management system. And it's a process to solve pest problems while minimizing risk to people and in the environment. And there's the key term. Yes, we could go out, we could buy chemicals, we could spray everything, kill everything, and we'd be done. But what are we leaving behind? So we want to focus on long-term prevention of pests, and we also use a combination of techniques. Sometimes the first thing out of the toolbox is not that kill them all's bug spray. Step one, monitor your garden. What's new in there? What if, what if, what's just, if someone just said they have yellow spots on leaves. How long have you noticed those? Has just happened? This is what you need to do. Sometimes keeping a journal is a good idea. It doesn't have to be a, a big, evolved, you know, fancy thing. A, a spiral notebook and you write down May 19th, I saw a whatever. And that way you can look back and you can see, when did I first see that? I went out last week, I saw white flies for the first time. Well, to me, that's just terrible. Um, see what's new in your garden. What was there yesterday? Is it a pest? How many pests are present? As Ann said, sometimes you gotta go out at night with a flashlight and kind of crawl around. And is it time to take action or can I just wait a little while? What's safe? So the IPM is interesting. We're gonna talk about the principles. Like I said, there's a whole IPM toolbox. We do biological, we do cultural, we do mechanical and physical, and then kind of the last resort is the chemical control. I found this um, quote in something I was reading, just getting ready for this, and I really liked it. And it's, it's, it goes along with everything else we're gonna talk about this evening, but it says, any activity of our species that reduces the adverse effects of another species, often called beneficial or biological control agents, because they keep pest population low enough to prevent significant damage. And I think that's so important, that significant damage. If it's wiping out your crop of cucumbers, that's more than significant damage. But if you're getting a little few little leaves, maybe a little chip, you know, a little chew on them, maybe that's not that important. So what we're gonna do is we're going tonight learn about natural enemies. Those are called the, pre the beneficial predators in the garden. We're gonna control ants when necessary because ants are not our friend. Uh, and we're gonna protect um, we're going to decide which way, which way are we going to protect our garden? Are we going to do cultural, mechanical, selective controls so that we don't harm them? As you can see, there's a picture of a green lacewing 
our larvae eating aphids. Someone talked about finding aphids. There's, there's your friend in the garden. Um, okay, do you think you know what a ladybug looks like or lady, ladybird beetle? Okay, there are several bugs that look kind of like that. Make certain that what you're looking at is really the ladybug. And someone was saying at one point that they were, they didn't know what the, the little yellow eggs looked like and they were smashing them in, in their garden. And I'm going, oh no, 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 you want to leave those. Because when you go and you buy a, uh, a container of ladybugs at the big box store or at the nursery store, you know they're not going to stay in your garden. It's much healthier if you can have them stay and reproduce on their own so you don't have to go out and buy them. So you can see there are the different life, life cycles of them. It's kind of an important one. You may want to hang on to that out of your package. You know, put it somewhere so you can remember what you have. And Ro, if I could just interject, yeah, this course. little life cycle here takes about 30 days. So from egg to larva to pupa, these larvae can eat 50 aphids or more a day. And they're eating all sorts of things. And then they grow up and become a ladybug or ladybird or lady beetle. <laughs> and then they live for about a year. So everything you wanted to know about lady beetles and more. Thank you, that sounds good. Okay, learn to recognize the signs of beneficial insect activity. Now, if you haven't eaten dinner yet, this might kind of turn your stomach or if you're trying to eat right now, you may not wanna hear this, but there are things like parasitic wasps that will mummify and you'll have just little husks. Um, the, the wasp is smaller than your fingernail. I mean, it's a little tiny thing and it lays eggs um, in the living out aphid. And then the tiny wasp hatches and it eats the aphid from the inside out. That's why I said, you may be kind of gross, but I think it's fascinating. And sometimes you can even find the, the, little, the little mummified aphids. They have a little hole where the, the, the little animal crawled out. So it's kind of interesting and kind of neat. I grew up That's on a beneficial. steady diet of sci-fi. And uh, when I started learning about insects, I was like, hey, they stole all of this from the real world, all those crazy alien movies. Oh, well, there's a, okay, what, what, what did they always say in those movies? Science has gone awry, you know, or has gone, yes. Okay, this is science and it's, it's, it's out there in your garden, hopefully. Um, pollinator and predator of cyphered or hoverflies, those are, the adults are the pollinators, but the larvae can eat hundreds of aphids in a month. So if you see something like that out in your garden, don't squish it. And that's why we wanna talk, eventually we're gonna talk about the chemical controls because sometimes that gets the bugs that you don't want to lose. Lace wings, again, the adult eats pests. Um, they will eat and prey and feed on the pollen and the nectar, and the larvae play, prey upon a variety of small insects, mealybugs, thrips, psyllids, mites, whiteflies, aphids, you name it, they seem to like it. So lace wings are one of those little insects, and even the insect eggs, that's one of those that you want to keep. Um, it says, <laughs> it slurps up a pest, guts like, like a juice box, like in a juice box. Yeah, basically. And all, all parts of it are, are beneficial to your garden. Now, benefic beneficial predators, there are lots of them. And it's kind of an interesting thing. Some of them we, we think of as harmful in our garden, but they're really not. The only time it's harmful is when we have knocked out what they eat and the, the population goes too big. But things like earwigs, spiders, centipedes, soldier beetles, wasps, um, stink bugs and bats. We don't have many bats in our area because it, there's so much growth. But if you live in an area with bats, wonderful, especially for mosquito control, just stay away from them. Sometimes they can be, they can, they can carry diseases. You just don't want to fool with them. One thing I will mention, Ro, is that yep. this is the only stink bug that's beneficial. A lot of the other ones can be pests. Yeah. And interestingly, earwigs will eat ant eggs, but 
So they're good to have in the garden to help manage ant populations. So the stomping on the earwig is not always a good idea. You want some in your garden. The snails and the slugs you don't want in your garden, but boy, the earwigs are okay. That's my own personal editorial comment. Okay, so um, things that you wanna do is you wanna provide water, nectar, shelter, or alternative food sources. Um, avoid using pesticides that kill everything, especially the beneficials. And time pesticide sprays for early morning or late evening. Now, when we talk about providing water, it doesn't mean leaving um, pans of water out, because remember, that can be a, a mosquito breeding area. So you want to make certain you're dumping out your, your water source, which I know most of you know to do that. Now, insect pest management, first identify the pest. What is it a pest? Are you really certain what it is? Maybe a little hand lens would help you. Um, pick it off, before you squish it, take a look at it. This might be something you want. Like I said, the person who was killing all the ladybug eggs shouldn't have done that. Just lost a whole crop of ladybugs. And you can visit the UC IPM Natural Enemy Gallery. And there's the website right there. We will be giving that website quite a few times today because it has got so much information, it's just incredible. And one of the things I love is, ah, there we go, the, the Beneficial Predator ID card. And it's a quick tip. Quick tips are available at most of the Master Gardener offices. Um, you can see them online in the uh, IPM website and you can download them for free. What I like to do with some of them that I really like is I put them into the plastic sheets in my binder so that I can find them easily and they don't get too messy when I drag them out to the garden to compare. And that's a good one to have, but there are lots of them. Okay, can you name the IPM principle that helps protect natural enemies or beneficial predators in the garden? And there's only one real good answer. And I can't vote, but I can give you a hint. Sorry about that. I forgot to click the button to let the two of you <laughs> vote. You're going to skew the results. Okay. Well, that's that's okay. <laughs> they all know the answer. This is a group I can't. Some people figure. are going for self control. That you know what? That one well, that's be not right. bad. Actually, Actually, that's not a bad answer because if you're not out there <laughs> trying to kill everything, however, <laughs> I like that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end. Let's see what we have. The polling here. Yes, ma'am. And an overwhelming 81% people went for biological control. I couldn't fool you. Okay, let's try another one. Okay. All right, let's see here. Oh, there's our answer. Okay, okay. question number two. Why is monitoring your garden so important? Why is that? All right, go ahead and vote. Should have some music behind it, shouldn't we? <laughs> you could sing, bro. That's rather not. You Let's should be different. able to choose multiple, more than one, it'll tell you. Yeah, if there's one answer you say, wait a minute, that's, that's not gonna work. So we've got about 66, 70% of people have voted. I'm gonna give everybody about five not seconds. everyone wants to vote. Sometimes they just like to think. It's true, it's true. So we're good, I think. We're gonna end our so. polling. And? and share the results. 95% of people said, because you can notice small problems and take steps to manage them before they get difficult, which is good. 52% yep. said you can pull weeds when they are small before they get out of hand. And 71% right. said you can notice a new critter and then determine if it's a pest or a beneficial insect. Good Very group. good. Good group, yep. So as you can see, they are all correct. All right, Ro, we did get a couple questions. Okay, I, what's going on? Denise wanted to know how common surfid flies are around here. And um, I see them all the time. I don't know about you, Ro. Where do you, where do you see a man around? A around flowers. Okay, just and pollinators. If you, if you go 
near any kind of flowering plant, you'll see the bees. They're the ones that are just, you know, making a beeline for the flowers. Yeah. Whereas the hoverflies or the surfed flies are the ones I've watched them before. I think, when do you eat? What are you doing? All they do, they go up and down and side and side and up and down and they'll rarely land. But I, I bet if you watch them enough, they'll land. So keep your eye out now that you know what to look for. You ever see them in your vegetable garden? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Especially if you've got, um, you know, if you let your arugula go to seed or, you know, some of your other plants. Okay, all right. Take a look. Uh, so um, somebody was saying, based on your comment, am I wasting my money buying ladybugs? So we're not going to discourage people against purchasing, you know, lady beetles, but there is research from the university that um, it can be difficult to get lady beetle populations to stay uh, because they have um, that need to migrate. Um, and well, also and those little leashes are hard to get around their necks, right? Yep. And you need yep. to have a lot of food for them. Uh, you just have to follow the instructions, put them at the base of a plant in the evening. You can refrigerate them during the day, spray the base of the plant with a little bit of sugar water so they have some food. Unfortunately, yeah, a lot of them will fly away. What I've noticed is um, the more I let the aphids take over my garden, the more ladybugs I have. You just have to wait for them and then you'll see all the other um, life stages. And uh, the tricky thing is they can't eat every single insect because then they wouldn't have anything to eat. So there has to be that balance of prey and predator. And so it's, it's really just up to you how much um, you can tolerate or, you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, it's a great thing to do for kids. Oh, Lisa wants oh, to know oh. if anyone has had success buying lace wings, lace wings. And wings arrive alive. So my understanding about lace wings is they are sent as larva and <laughs> They will eat each other, so they're in a container, and they should be like seized candy in their own little special spot. So hopefully they would arrive alive and not eat each other. But um, if Lisa means, you know, maybe they just die, I don't know. Um, I guess you'd have to contact the company. Yeah, make sure they have a money-back guarantee on those. Yeah. I would wonder. <laughs> All right, let's see. Do we get all the questions answered? What's that one? Too hot. Oh, shipping. Lisa think, seems to think it's too yeah. hot in, the sh in during shipping, and I kind of wonder. It could be. Yeah. Tricky. All right, great questions, Ro. I think we are ready to move on and talk about cultural control. So that is another tool in our IPM toolbox, integrated pest management, in case you've forgotten, it is kind of a long word. So cultural control is another tool. And so a couple different ways to think about cultural control is that you are changing the environment of your garden or your house, depending on where you're using IPM, to make it less attractive to pests or to take things away from them or to use things that they won't like as much. So when you purchase a tomato, you can see here this particular Roma tomato is a VF, which is, stands for verticillium and fusarium. And those are diseases that you can get that live in the soil and they basically plug up the root system of your plant. We'll talk about them a little bit, but you can get cultivars that are more resistant. Removing sources of food and water, you know, leaving um, out um, different things that pests like can cause them to, you know, be more attracted to your garden. So this time of year, if you're watering enough to get snails, you're probably watering too much. Um, snails should be going into hibernation now and just chilling somewhere. Actually, I guess they're not chilling. Row would be the opposite. They're solarizing. I don't know what they're doing. So they're hanging out somewhere just trying to make it through the summer. So if you're giving them water, then you're helping them prolong their life cycle. You wanna eliminate hiding places. There's a lot of winter weeds that were growing over the winter and that are you know, getting bigger now like this cheese weed. And look who loves it, aphids, white flies, plant bugs, squash bugs. The minute your garden goes in, they're like, oh, hey, somebody just built a buffet, I'm gonna move. And then they leave this area and they attack your, pest, your plant and then you wonder where did all these pests come from? 
Crop rotation is another great way to um, discourage pests. So for those of you who may not know, eggplant, tomato, pepper, and potato are in the Solanaceae family. So if you have different areas of your garden and you're rotating, don't plant any of these in the same space year after year, you wanna switch it up. Uh, fallowing is another great way to try to control pests, especially nematodes. We get a lot of calls about nematodes and they are very difficult to control. They're a microscopic round worm that lives in the soil. They're not harmful to humans, but they love just about every kind of vegetable. And so if you get them, the way you would know is that your crops just stop thriving. So your, your whole garden will you know, just suddenly look like it's in some sort of a time warp and nobody's growing and then everything starts turning yellow and brown and dies out. Um, Verticillin wilt can also look like that. So that's why if you cut the stem, you'll see if it's that. Um, to find out if it's a nematode or root knot nematode, you would pull the whole plant out. And if it's covered in a bunch of nodules, then you would know you have this. And so one way to lower the population is to fallow. And fallowing is a lot of times something that people think of when, you know, let's just leave this area alone and that's called fallowing. But technically you also need to keep the soil moist. So you really need to pretend you have a garden there and just keep tending it. So you keep the soil moist, every weed that comes up, you um, eliminate. And so then the nematode eggs keep hatching and growing and they have nothing to feed in. Now, if you leave an area fallow and you do nothing, those nematode eggs are just hanging out and they can survive for quite a while. And then once you add moisture, you know, you, you're gonna help them out. So here is a table for uh, nematode management. It's just a example of what you could do uh, so that you can um, lower, uh, a lot of times you can lower the population enough so that you can at least plant something for one season before you need to follow it again. Can you get rid of nematodes totally, Anne? Such a good question, Ro. I don't know of anybody who really has eradicated them. I think they're pretty difficult once you get them. So you just have to kind of manage them and work around them. All right, so plant health. You know, what's happening? Is your plant not getting enough water? Is it getting too much water? Did you plant your tomatoes in two hours of sun? You know, you're gonna start seeing problems if you didn't plant them correctly. So a lot of times um, stressed plants are more susceptible to pests. Another thing you wanna do is mulch around your plants and that helps conserve water so that your plants can um, grow. A lot of times people will ask us, how much should I water? And unfortunately the answer is, Ro knows, is it depends, it depends. So it depends on your soil type, it depends on the weather, it depends on what you've planted. But one thing I can tell you is that once your crops are established, you will not need to water every day. You wanna water maybe two or three times a week and make sure that you're really getting the soil moist. If you're not sure if it's moist, you get a shovel or a trowel and you dig down and you look and see um, how much moisture the plants are getting. And like I said, keep that mulch around there so that you can make sure to um, save water. All right, do we have any questions about cultural controls? At this point, we have it's no just, questions. It's not as exciting as, as uh, biological control, Ro. <laughs> okay, there's nothing quite like a parasitic wasp to get people excited. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on, on and take another poll. Ro, you wanna go ahead and read this I would love to. Name the IPM principle that changes the environment to make it less suitable for the pests. And we have four answers. Only one is going to be correct. Okay, we've got quite a few people voting here. They all know it. We do. Okay, we're going to end the poll. Okay. And share the results. And a majority of people got it right. Yep. The answer yep. is yep. cultural control. Cultivation was a trick question because you can um, cultivate, except um, that is one we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Okay. Excellent. There's our answer. 
All right, so now we are going to move on to mechanical and physical controls, another way to control pests in um, our IPM toolbox. So this one is pretty basic, just you're blocking the pest, you're killing the pest, you're trapping it. So this gentleman here is stepping on a cockroach. That's a great way to um, make sure that this particular insect is not uh, making more uh, cockroaches if you are trying to keep the population down. We've got some strips here to help catch white flies. A lot of times trapping is more of a monitoring uh, control. You may not necessarily control the population with trapping, but it's helpful for monitoring to see what you've got. And then um, with gophers <clears throat> and moles and, and other things like that, trapping is one of the ways you wanna help, you wanna control them. So here we have them all listed. You will see, oh, just kidding. You will see the first five, one, two, three, four, just kidding, the first four are all about weeds. Weeds are a real problem in gardens. So there's hoeing and mowing and mulching and flaming. And how many of you during COVID looked out the window and were like, oh, look at all those weeds. Oh, they're small. I should go pull those now. I'm going to pull those now because it would be much easier to wait until later. A month goes by, same thought happens. This was me. So I only just pulled those weeds recently and they were huge. Lucky for me, the ground was still moist because it had, there had been a rain. So I got them out. But um, the smaller the weed, the easier it is to pull. If you've got a situation where weeds are going to flower and go to seed, some weeds can put out hundreds to thousands of seeds per plant. Those seeds live in the environment and what we call the seed bank, not a place you really wanna invest, but it's a place where weeds can be stored for many years and then you accidentally dig them up and they sprout again as soon as it gets wet. So mow uh, before those uh, seeds get uh, established. All right, mulching is another way. It can, you know, you can put a good three, four, five layers of mulch to suppress weeds. Flaming. Flaming is something that you have to be careful with. It's not what it sounds like. You're, you don't have a torch. You do have a flame, but you're introducing heat and you're doing it next to a weed. Um, and as this person is doing here, um, I got to try it. It's pretty fun. It's like, you know, remember the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz, how she melted? That's exactly what happens to the weed. It just goes, ah, and it just melts. Um, I do know somebody who lit his front yard on fire and was wondering why the fire truck pulled up to his house. Uh, it's because he was flaming in the front yard and he accidentally lit a pile of leaves on fire. So you do have to use caution. Um, flaming is used a lot in schools because it's a great way to get rid of weeds without the pesticides. And you know, there's a lot of sidewalk areas. We talked about trapping. This is a neat way to trap snails. You can make this little board with some uh, posts on it and set it down and keep the area moist and then collect them all later. Uh, you can buy a very cheap beer and um, take a pie tin and bury it at the same level as the soil and um, the snails. And sometimes earwigs are attracted to the yeast and they will fall in and drown. And then there's screening and barriers. So lots of different kinds of controls. We mentioned earlier uh, following for nematodes. You can also use soil solarization. This is a huge uh, process to undertake, but it can be really worth it. it. You can kill a lot of pests about 12 inches into the soil. Um, unfortunately, sometimes some nematodes will bury deeper and they'll escape, but you will reduce their populations enough to have at least one garden that following year and um, you want to um, cultivate and get rid of all the plant matter, level it, irrigate, and then you lay a clear tarp. And we have uh, really great instructions on, on our UC IPM website site on how to do this. So if you're thinking about soil solar, solarization, now is a good time because our Central Valley weather gets very, very hot. And so in June and July and August, those are great times to um, solarize your soil. Um, if you're listening and you're from San Francisco or somewhere cloudy, this is really not something that may work for you. 
All right, Ro, I'm going to launch poll number four. Do you wanna read for us here? Muted, okay. Name the IPM method that controls pests by killing, blocking, or trapping the pests. Mechanical, cultural, physical or machine, Magellan control, or physiological control. Okay, we had everybody vote. And as you can see, 100% of people 100%. went for mechanical or physical control. Another going, great physical oh my control gosh, is this a- question, This poll was nothing, yes. A, full, okay. a fly swatter, bro. <laughs> we have a few questions. We and do, Sarah wants okay. To know Type of what, what kind of smulch do you think is the best? She says cedar. She asked if that cedar is the best. Oh, what kind of mulch is the best? Mm -hmm. I think they're all great, um, any kind. The main thing is to um, you know, get as much on there so that you can protect the soil and suppress weeds. It's more really about how many inches you use. So three plus inches is great. And you can either buy some really, and you can buy some really good commercially made if you don't have a shredder or a, a place to, you know, that makes the mulch. There's some very good ones that are in a bag. Um, okay, Heidi says, with control panel, a silly answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 just a little Sorry, bit. I couldn't help yeah, myself. Yeah, no, okay, well. It's hard to come up with all of these, um, you know. Can you use just yeast and water rather than beer? Because mm. part of it is there's sugar in the beer, which also is an attractor. So, I you know, know Heidi, if Heidi, you try it and it works, please yeah. let us know. We would be interested. Yeah, I don't know if it's the yeast or if it's the sugar that attracts them. I think it said it was the yeast in the um, pest note, but I'd have to triple check. Okay. Uh, works for snugs that are teeny tiny, like a piece of compost. They eat my mm. strawberries. Uh huh. They sure do. That's where you get out at night with a with, and pick them off, or early morning pick them off, and. Drop Let the area dry out a little bit in between so that um, they don't have as much moisture. Maybe try to kill them off a bit. Um, there's also some snail baits that are, uh, there's one that is, uh, the active ingredient is iron phosphate. I'll type that into the chat. Uh, I, it go, there's lots of different brands, but iron phosphate is essentially a fertilizer but it also, um, it kills snails and slugs. You just have to follow the directions. This is the time it's less that. toxic. All right, so now speaking of uh, pesticides, we're gonna talk about chemical control. It's the last tool in our toolbox. And so the goal of the Master Gardener program is to help eliminate unnecessary pesticide use. Uh, I used to work at a nursery many years ago and someone called and said, I have a pest on a tree and I've sprayed everything in my garage on it, but it didn't die. And I think I was about 17 at the time and I was like, um, what kind of tree was it? And they're like, I don't know. So they didn't know what the pest was and they didn't know what the tree was. So, you know, um, we really want to eliminate that sort of um, use of pesticides. We want to think about uh, first of all, like Rose said, monitoring and identifying. And then when we've got a situation where we can't, we've, we've used our other methods or we can't use our methods. So uh, in the example of a peach leaf curl, uh, there are no controls in the first three um, toolbox items that will work. You have to use a chemical control, but you can uh, choose something that is a less toxic method, which is a copper-based spray. So we really want to emphasize less toxic options first, because our goal is to minimize risks to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms and the environment. And so that also includes our water supply. So what is a pesticide? It's anything used to kill a pest. And so it should always be used with caution. Some people will say, oh, I don't use pesticides, but I, I use weed killer or I spray weeds. Well. Weed killers and herbicides are pesticides. And you have to be careful because you can worsen problems or harm people or wildlife accidentally. So always use caution. Uh, even organic pesticides can cause harm. There are some organic pesticides with 20% acetic acid, which you also may know in another name as vinegar. 
And at 8% on your salad, it's okay. But at 20%, you could burn your eyes, your skin, you could inhale it. So be aware that um, organic does not always mean safe. Always read the label. The label is the law. So if uh, the label says one teaspoon per gallon, do your best to avoid doing two teaspoons per gallon. It's hard sometimes, I know if I'm doing laundry, sometimes I'll think, well, maybe I should add a little more, but it's just best to follow the directions. And so if you're reading the bottle of a pesticide, you'll see on the very front, in the very smallest possible print, something called the active ingredient. Um, this is a caution. There's three different signs. There's caution, warning and danger. And this is based on something called the LD50, which is the lethal dose. So a pesticide that has a caution is a lot less likely um, to harm people than warning. And then, you know, the final one is danger. Now, all of them, of course, should be used uh, carefully and following the directions. So here we've got the active ingredient, potassium salts of fatty acids, which is a complicated way of saying soap. So that's, that's kind of tricky when you go to the store, you're like, wait, what is this? Um, we're gonna talk about petroleum oils, neem and other plant-based oils, BT products, and a little bit about 25B, which just stands for like food grade. So any product that has cinnamon in it or garlic or chili powder, those are 25B products and they are less toxic. All right, so using horticultural soaps or oils, you may think, well, what's the difference between these two? They're both seem like a good idea. Horticultural soaps will manage aphids, mealybugs, white flies, mites, and they are the safest to use around beneficial insects. Horticultural oils will take it one step further and they will kill these same insects, but also scale. Scale can be really tricky to get rid of, especially the hard ones. You wanna to try to smother them. Um, spider mites can be difficult to control, psyllids and thrips. Now you want to be careful because you don't want to use either of these products when the temperature is above 90 degrees because you will burn your plant. I have done it before. My entire plant turned yellow and I realized, oh, I guess I didn't see that part on the label. So I'll learn from my mistake. Um, make sure you don't spray when beneficials are active, which you know they're not usually up super early or late in the evening. And the good thing is when you spray these, the residues will not you know, harm beneficial insects if they're still hanging around. The one thing to remember about these types of pesticides is that they don't stay in the environment long. So if you read the label, it's a little bit more work. It's not gonna be, you know, kills a hundred insects and done and you never have to do another thing for six months. It's, you know, it will kill a lot of the insects that are present the following week, they're gonna be back. And so you have to keep checking them and that's why they are considered less toxic pesticides. So we just wanna have people think about um, pests. Should you take action? It really depends on the pest, um, how many you've got, your tolerance level. So observe and monitor, and then decide if you need to take action. All right, Ro, are you ready to read our poll? And you, okay, yes, I can handle this one. one minute. Okay, what are two less toxic pesticides you can use in the garden? Dish soap and olive oil, horticultural soaps and oils, kill them all pesticides that kills 100 pests and their friends. All right, great. We've got over half the people who have voted. Of course. I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share our results, Ro. Horticultural soaps and oils the winter, yes. Remember, don't confuse horticultural soap with stuff in the kitchen. They're different animals. Yeah, so, so we recommend using uh, formulated pesticides that have been tested. Um, stuff in your kitchen, you have to be careful. You can um, cause other harm. Um, some of the um, different dish soaps might have things in them that wouldn't be good for the environment or you, know, you wouldn't want to get it in your soil. So that's something to think about. And we do have a question All from right. Heidi. Do the oils have to make contact with the unwanted pest? Absolutely, or can they very pick it up good somewhere question. else. Yes, in order to smother the pest, you have to make contact. So let's say your orange tree has a bad scale problem. 
The other thing about pests is aside from identifying them, you need to understand their life cycle. And scale insects are very interesting. Um, once they hatch, the females choose a spot and that's where they stay for life. The male are like these tiny flies that fly around and they mate with the females. The little babies are born underneath the female and then she kind of leans up and lets them out in spring and they crawl away. Well, when they're crawling, that's when they're most vulnerable and when you will be able to really um, make a difference in their population as far as hard scales. Um, with soft scales, it's also the case that it's easier to get them during that crawler stage. So yes, Heidi, you've got to spray the soaps and oils directly on the pests um, to uh, smother them or kill them. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Ro. Okay. okay. All right, let's do a little talking about insects, diseases, weeds, and abiotic problems. One of my favorites. Okay, common insect and animal pests. We've talked about this, so there's one more time. Our all-time favorite aphids, and as Ann said earlier, they come in a multitude of colors. So just because you don't see that light green or that yellow, you may have an aphid out there. They can be brown and they can be kind of a reddish color. And so just have to look carefully, look closely. Um, caterpillars, gophers, one of my son's favorite pests, uh, nematodes, spider mites, oh, terrible, uh, stink bugs and leaf footed bugs. And those are really neat looking. Uh, and white flies, everyone's favorite, which can decimate just about anything. So again, the aphids will suck the plant juices and leave behind a sticky honeydew. And you look for parasitic aphids, um, paralyzed aphids, excuse me. Uh, control ants to protect the beneficial insects. Ants are kind of like the, the, the guards of these aphid colonies. You can hose it off with water, squish it with your fingers, and choose a less, text, less toxic pesticide like an industrial in insecticide oil or um, a soap. Um, aphids should be gone by now, but you may have just a few hanging around. So don't, don't I, would, I would just say, try to squish them. Just pull them off and squish them. That's pretty easy and it doesn't take a whole lot of work. Um, ants and aphids are best friends. Ants farm aphids. They move them around like small cattle. I, 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 this is just fascinating to me. Uh, ants also protect, protect aphids from beneficial insects. So what do we have to do? We have to get rid of the ant using a less toxic way. And there are several things. There are uh, baits containing borat-based uh, products. Um, left alone, ants are susceptible to attacks by the beneficials. But if you have ants in there, if you can get the ants out of there, that helps a whole lot. But if you have ants around, you're gonna have problems because they're going to keep whatever beneficials away from their cow aphids. Isn't that interesting? I swear, I just find that one very interesting. Okay, now let's go on to another fun thing is the tomato fruit worm or the corn earworm. Um, tomatoes, beans, and corn. You can hand pick them off. Um, you can cut off two thirds of the cob. Best thing is it's two to, to three inches, row or inches. I'm sorry, not that's okay. That would be a whole bunch you'd lose. Okay, but it's important. You can you can actually work on the cob as it's growing. However, it has to be at the right time. It's when the silks first appear, and you're going to use mineral oil on a dropper, and you're just going to touch the inside three to five days after the silks appear. Now, if you have a whole lot of corn, that might be a little more work than you wanna do um, because they're gonna to have to be done several times. About every three days, you're going to have to do that. But if you have just a few you know, ears of corn, kind of a fun thing that you're doing, you may want to do that to get rid of the, uh, the tomato fruit worm or the corn earworm. Uh, it's important in timing for the bugs and um, really, I, I don't know. They don't do that much to an ear of corn. Crack it off is my feeling, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, some people just decide they just can't stand that. And I, that's okay. 
Um, and you're going to remove anything right after harvest. You don't want to keep that stuff around. I want to get rid of it. Okay, everyone's favorite, mine included, the tomato hornworm. And those things can get so big. I know they talk about um, you have to look for the poop, okay? That's kind of gross. But they can absolutely, the larva can eat, they can decimate a tomato plant. And what you know, what I usually notice is first you'll see this stalk sticking out and there are no leaves on it. And you think that is the strangest looking thing. Why? And then you lean in closer and that doggone thing just blends in. It's a camouflaged animal. Um, I've got to tell this story about my friend's quiet, tiny, calm little mother who when she'd see one, she would go crazy yelling terrible words and she would get her shears and she would chop these things up in the garden. I know, no. Usually what I just do is I just cut the, the branch that the thing is sitting on and I get rid of that. If you have chickens, they like to eat them, but you'd have to have some contact with them. So I just as soon just throw them out. Um, you can use the BT on them um, and it kills the caterpillars when they're small. However, I usually don't see it until they're huge in my eyes and you've got the naked stems. So it, it can be beneficial, um, but the BT can, can do, you know, it can kill beneficial caterpillars if applied to the larva fruit leaves. So you've got to decide what, 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 do you, what do you want? I would just soon just throw the thing out, but everyone's got a different, different level. And um, again, we've got a wonderful pest note about hornworms. Okay. The cucumber beetle, it's kind of interesting. People will say, oh, I've got this little ladybug. It's really kind of interesting, but she's got yellow spots on it. And you think, a ladybug with yellow spots? No, it isn't. It's probably a cucumber beetle. It's not even shaped like a ladybug, but they think anything that has spots on it and is, is, is a friendly bug. No, they chew hold in leaves. Um, the control is kind of difficult. However, the nice thing is you can see them because of the bright color and you need to cover the seedlings. Um, they really like that. So cover that, you're gonna use, you know, something to protect them until they get growing. You know, take it off, put it on, um, but th those little suckers can just eat a whole, whole bunch of stuff. Gophers, let me start with what was not gonna work. And there are tons of cures for gophers. I've never heard of this one, chewing gum before, but I'm sure someone said, you know, you throw a pack of juicy fruit or something down the hole and the gopher chew, I don't know why that would work. Uh, human hair, uh, sonar or sonic high frequency devices. My, my favorite are the fake owls, snakes and hawks. Now, I don't quite understand how you expect a gopher that's underneath the ground most of its life to see this fake owl but supposedly that's supposed to scare, they don't work, okay? Uh, you need to use a trap that's fully recommended in the uh, integrated pest management website and they will help you with that. But a gopher can eat, you know, one gopher can eat your entire garden. And if you live in a new area that's had construction around it, the gophers have to go somewhere and they're in this valley, chances are they're going to your, your garden because that's easy pickings. One thing uh, we can remind people too, or tell people is that um, if they check out our UC, the UC IPM website about gophers, you can watch somebody set a gopher trap so you can see how it's done. There's two videos on um, two different traps because there is an art to it for sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's uh, nematodes. And of course, Anne did a really good description of the nematodes. The root, the root knot, and that's the most common one. And you can see it when you pull the dead plant out of the ground. And it attached, it, like she said, most vegetables it likes, except not corn and artichokes. So corn, you've got other problems and you've got to be doing, working on the silt, but at least you won't have nematodes. So there's the good news. And artichokes, I, I don't, snails, artichokes are, you know, snails like artichokes, but I don't know a lot of other insects. And what other insects like? There is a um, caterpillar that likes it a lot. I had it last year and the name, 
escapes me, but it's a very strange looking caterpillar. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have to think about it, but okay. it eats the right. stalks and like, um, can get into the, the heads of the artichokes. And I had them really bad last year. And this year, I, I only saw one. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Um, how do you take care of it? Well, you, you, you'd use the, the varieties that are, are, that are resistant to nematodes. And Anne talked about it when you look at the tag, the tomato tag. Um, soil solarization will work, crop rotation, following using containers with potting soil. As we said, usually it's very difficult to eradicate nematodes. Sometimes it means moving your garden to another part of the year. The other thing is don't forget to keep your, your garden tools clean. If you, um, in between, sanitize the garden tools, wipe them off, make certain they're cleaned, um, because you can transfer some of these things from plant to plant. So we recommend 10% bleach in water. water in a gallon I, know, I just remembered the name of the pest. What the is artichoke it? Artichoke plume moth. The artichoke so, plume moth. Okay, well, it's it's got its own pest. So you'll know if you have it, because it okay. will chew down those stalks like you wouldn't believe how much really? they can eat. Oh, yeah, actually, know. they give uh, the tomato hornworm a run for their money, for sure. Good sized puppies, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about spider bite mites and perfect for our area, hot weather and dusty conditions. So, and they will appear often after that broad spectrum pesticide is used because everything else is knocked out and these little puppies come crawling back. And um, those are the pesticides that kills 95 things in your garden, 100 things in your garden, uh, leaves no pest allowed, okay? It will, will allow the spider mites to come back. So you wanna use an industry insecticidal oil or spray early in the morning or late in the evening on the spider mite problem. And I don't know, there are, I've seen spider mites on the strangest things before. So don't look at it and go, it can't be spider mites. You know, my succulents, it can't be spider mites. Yeah, it can. They'll, they're not real picky, I don't think. Yeah, the other thing is once you see this webbing and it's a real mess like that, just pull it out and throw it away before it spreads. Yeah, and it's, no it doesn't look- spray is gonna get rid of that. No, and it doesn't look like regular spider webs. It's, it's, it's almost like a cloth type thing. It's so dense. I mean, it's not, you know. It, I think it looks like a Halloween decoration kind of. Okay, yeah. Like the, that, that stuff that you put on the, the, the trees that you can't get off later. Yep, exactly. So again, the hot weather is perfect for it. Stink bugs, they suck plant juices. They damage leaves and fruit and pesticides don't work because the bugs will fly away. So you're out there and you're pulling them off and you're throwing them into soapy water, okay? Or stepping on them if that's better, if that makes you feel better. Um, there are all kinds of stink bugs, you know, there's this, like, like the, you see the neat pictures there. There's the Southern green stink bug, that's a real cutie. Um, brown, what is that one? There's a brown stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bug. I love that one. I like the leaf, yeah. the leaf footed. That's a cute one also. I'm, I have a dog in my lap, so excuse me. And she's, she's recuperating. So she's feeling kind of bad. So we're a family show. What can I say? Then white flies. I, I, Bro, you can't talk about your dog and then not show everybody. Oh, she's pitiful looking right now. Look at her. Look at her. <laughs> oh, is that I'm cricket sorry. or June bug? Yes, something like that. Okay, white flies can decimate. I, I've seen them take out a whole cucumber plant in no time at all. Um, they suck the juices and they fly around. You can find them in the early morning or the late evening. You just turn it over. And what I always think, it looks like your plant has dandruff because it's little teeny tiny white things but if you shake it slightly, they fly away. And um, often again, you'll see that after a broad spectrum pesticide. One of those kills everything in the garden except for spider mites and white flies, which will come back quickly. I found the sticky traps work real well. Hosing things off works real well. 
um, use a less toxic pesticide. Again, this is the, the soaps and the oils that can get them. However, you gotta remember, you have to spray the underside of the leaves. You've gotta hit them to get rid of them. So that'll, that'll help with that. You know, Ro, one thing we didn't mention is in the very beginning, we talked about aphids and ants and how they're best friends. Right. White flies are also good friends with ants. So if you have a tree okay. that's, or, you know, other plants with white flies and you see ants around, then you will want to control them. Okay. Okay. And during this presentation, just... you know, we've been talking about controlling ants, but you know, if they're just in the garden doing their thing, they do a lot of good, you know, they break things down, um, you know, they have their place in the food web, but if they are interfering with beneficial insects, we do recommend, um, you know, keeping them out. Yeah. Okay. Um, Heidi just made some, an interesting comment. Let me just real, real quickly, since we're on um, uh, white fly, she makes her own sticky cardstock uh, uh, with, she smears Vaseline on the cardstock, which I had never heard of before, and she uses yellow. They seem to pre prefer the yellow, maybe. I mean, that's that's what they sell also. So, and you can just put them at the level of the plant, you know, on a little stake or something. That's good to know, and it's it's cheap, and it doesn't harm anything else. Thanks, Heidi. I yeah, appreciate it. One thing uh, we forgot to say is when you use that sticky tangle foot, mm. you want to make sure that you put it at the height above your cat's tail, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> there have been stories of animals getting that sticky stuff on them, and you cannot get that off. No, no, and but it does come off in the furniture in the house. Yes. So in, in the case of vegetable gardens, there's a, not a lot of vegetables that you're probably going to want to use those sorts of things on, or you may not need to use because they're not around a lot. There, it, it's a little bit more um, applicable towards uh, fruit trees. Yeah. All right, Ro, are we ready to launch our Are we ready for another next poll? question? Okay. Ants protecting scales and aphids in the garden are best controlled using... <laughs> And so borate we say, based. we call them borate based products and it's, it's also really known as boric acid. acid. So that is the um, active ingredient. And a lot of times it's a more of a liquid form. And so if you use an ant, um, a pesticide to kill ants and it kills them immediately, that's a bad sign. That means you're just killing the ants that you see and you might feel like, yeah, I got them. You know, let's say they're coming in your house, but the um, ants um, have a colony, and if you want to get rid of that colony and keep them from coming again, the boric or borate-based products are the best, which I just gave away the answer, but everybody <laughs> knew that anyway. Um, Everyone knew anyway. Yeah, they Everyone knew. knew. And, and so if you use these uh, products, they're formulated so that the ants carry them uh, back to the queen, and eventually, slowly, everybody dies off. Right. And of course, borage is a, an herb and bougainvillea is a beautiful vine. So you can't <laughs> fool this group. No, These are gardeners. Creative. These are gardeners. Okay. Um, okay, Lisa says that ants love to crawl all over artichokes and even eat the roots. Mm, so Ro, um, huh. yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of times people think that ants eat plants because they see them hanging around, but ants, um, do not um, actually eat plants unless we're thinking about the ants in the um, Amazon that are those leaf cutters. And even in that situation, they're cutting the leaves to feed a fungus, and that's a whole other story. But ants, um, they don't eat our food, but they're usually out and about just, you know, looking for food. They're scavengers. White flies, neem oil. So this is a good question. Read yeah. the label. So if you find the product, um, probably neem oil is um, suggested for white flies because it's an oil. And we did talk about earlier how oils um, are also used. Um, neem oil is, I need to go back and double check. Um, it may or may not be a little bit more toxic than a horti an other horticultural oils. You'll just have to check, but it's the same situation. Um, you want to um, only use it in the morning or late evening when the um, beneficial insects aren't present. 
and that's it. So okay, Anne. Well, Dennis asked a question, or mm -hmm. sorry, not Dennis, Alan made a great comment, which really was very uh, witty. He said he has a problem with uh, cockroaches that come in the house and they don't seem to have any natural enemies besides us, which is true. Uh, so I let him know that, um, again, in this case, there are boric acid or borate type of uh, baits that you can purchase. And um, later on, I will remember to put the cockroaches pest note in the um, chat. All right, so let's talk about two diseases. How many of you are already seeing powdery mildew in your garden? Someone commented earlier that they were. And then verticillum and fusarium wilt, which may or may not show up, hopefully not, but when they do, you'll, you'll know um, when you find them. So two people raise their hands, so they must be seeing uh, these problems. So shaded plants are the most affected. So if you are planting something and it's not getting enough sun, that can be a place where powdery mildew can thrive. So you can wash powdery mildew off with a gentle stream of water. A lot of um, fungi and other problems can be spread by water, but not powdery mildew. It can be killed by water, but not just a little. If you just use a little, then you will spread it around. But if you hose it good, um, you can help um, kill it off. Now, once it gets to like a really big stage, by that time, it's, it's probably not going to work because this fungus, if you could see it under a microscope, has grown over and you're not just gonna be able to wash it off. So you can use neem oil, which has fungicidal properties. So the cool thing it, about this less toxic pesticide is that it kills insects and is a fungicide. So instead of having two things in your cupboard, you can just have one. And this is kind of interesting and you might think, that, you know, oh, there's some yellow spots, there's these brown, you know, crunchy areas on my tomato leaves. It must be water, it might be a disease. Yes, it is, it's powdery mildew. And it just has, you know, a little bit of a tricky look to it. And then when you look again, this could even look like the same symptoms. That's why it can be really hard to distinguish some of these problems. And that's why we're here as the Master Gardeners to help you identify pests. So the fungus um, of verticillum that I've mentioned earlier, it will penetrate the roots, destroying these water carrying cells. And so they will not be able to transport water and then your plant will just slowly start to kind of crinkle up and turn yellow and die. Uh, unfortunately, it's spread in soil, water, on garden tools. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to get rid of. So going forward, if you do have it, you have to use resistant varieties or um, try following. All right, do we have any questions, Ro? Yeah, this is, a, this is a good one, Anne. I like this one. Can you use diluted milk to, continue mm. to control mildew? We, um, we don't recommend it because um, it's not something we've tested. So uh, we really only recommend things that have been tested um, by the university. And as you can imagine, there's so many different things out there and we can't test them all. So that's why we usually recommend using a product um, that's already formulated to kill the pest. Thank you. All right, Ro, time to talk about weeds. Weed ID. Okay, first you identify the weed. Is it an annual or perennial? grass or a broadleaf. Understand the type of weed and its life cycle. And I, I did not even realize there were annual and perennial weeds. I knew there were grasses and broadleaves. But if you're not certain what you have, again, consult Master Gardener, bring it in, look at the weed gallery. They have a, a beautiful, beautiful set of photos that you can look at. But common annual weeds, my personal favorite is spurge. I have seen more varieties of spurge. I really imagined before this valley was irrigated that it was covered with spurge because spurge grows everywhere. And those, the, this is one of the plants that Ann said can produce thousands of seeds when it goes into flower. It's incredible. Uh, uh, sow whistle, crabgrass, which of course is a fun one, annual bluegrass and mallow. And mallow is one of those where people will say, oh my gosh, I have these beautiful geraniums that I didn't plant. And it does look 
kind of like a geranium. But then when you watch it after a while, you know, uh uh, no, that's no geranium. Yeah, get rid of it. Yes. So again, well, remember, even though this is a vegetable class, I am going to make a comment about lawns. Okay. So one of our advisors once wrote a uh, paper that was said um, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, um, Dallas grass. Why does it matter? Why do you care? And the reason is because of the life cycle. So if you're going to try to kill uh, a grass um, like crabgrass in a lawn, um, and then you, you know, you're trying to kill Bermuda grass or not kill Bermuda grass. It's very important to know about the life cycle so you can uh, get rid of the correct weed. Right. And get rid of it at the right time. Oh, yes, uh, uh, real quickly. And Denise, our, our pal Denise says oxalis. Oh yeah, the, the, the pretty clover that grows like mad. Yes, that's a terrible one. Um, perennial weeds, Bermuda yeah. grass, fine weed, and nut sedge. Nut sedge, one of those things that once those things start, it's really hard to eradicate. And usually um, it's in very wet areas. So you figure, okay, I've watered too much in that area. I, I've, the I, I've done it. Thing is, yeah, the unfortunate thing is even if you dry it out, it doesn't matter. No. Um, the cool thing is if you can pull them out before they get four or five leaves, you'll get them before they form that little nutlet. But once that you know, these guys here are pretty mature. Once yep. um, you get these guys, then you try to pull them out. If that little nut is left behind, uh, then, you know, you're going to get more. And when you pull them out, it looks just like a piece of bark that's attached to the plant as a root. So when you pull them out, make sure to dispose of them right away. Don't just do like, you know, I do with a lot of weeds, pull them out and throw them somewhere because they're biodegradable, you know, and you don't need to worry about it. Um, but yeah, watch for that. Yeah, they'll just keep going. Uh, bindweed, uh, all of these are perennials, which is wonderful if this is what you want to grow, but these are weeds, remember? Um, weed control, early, get it when it's young. Uh, perennials, control them again early, get them when they're young. If you've got it really bad, consider solarization, but it's got to be really, really bad. Uh, the best thing is the hand pulling and the hoeing. It's a constant battle. It's us against the weeds. And there are so many of them and they grow so well. It's just a problem. Usually, like Ann said, when the soil is moist, it's easier. When it starts drying out, then you have to moisten the soil so that you can pull the weeds out because you want to get the whole root. Like, unlike a lot of our plants, if you leave a little bit of root, it can grow again. Okay, pesticides, herbicides, weed killers. Okay, what, what, what should you use? Okay, some organic weed killers are effective on small weeds. Larger weeds are difficult to control. So what you probably wanna do is consult the master gardeners or the UC IPM. Again, remember, they have incredible amount of resource and the, the website is, is just phenomenal. You can just spend so much time going through that. Um, any questions, Anne? I don't see any more questions. Yes, I saw this. Well, you can move on to abiotic. That's a fun one, okay. I like the abiotic. It simply means it's without life, okay. Unfortunately, some of these, these problems are caused by man, the underwatering and the, under, and the overwatering, but they consider that abiotic. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, poor pollination can be a problem. Sunburn can be a problem. Then again, the under and the overwatering. And you can tell real easily with a lot of our plants is that leaves will start yellowing, maybe dropping. Uh, if it's underwatered, in this valley with the heat, often you have wilt, you have droop. And sometimes it'll come back if you water and sometimes it won't. Let's you know, about one thing that's interesting too, Ro, is- What's that? You know how your zucchini plant will wilt on a hot day, it's 100 degrees, you gave it water. That's just what's gonna happen. Um, it's, not, it's normal and luckily they come back, so. Or not luckily in my case. 
<laughs> I don't do zucchini. Too many zucchini. Uh -huh, too many zucchinis. Okay. An abiotic problem often is the, the lack of a pollinator. Um, you just, you, you have these beautiful, as you can see there, not so beautiful cucumber vines. You've got all these flowers, you've got all this, and then you're not getting any cucumbers or you're getting cucumbers that don't look good. Um, you want to look, maybe you don't have a pollinator in there. You need to have more than one plant. One plant's not going to do it. You have to have, usually they say three cucumber plants. Um, maybe the male and the female aren't timed at the right thing. There, there's a lot you can't do. Anything. The abiotic simply means that it's, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, the fruit won't form or you'll always have blossom drop. But you're, every, all the blossoms are dropping. You're not getting any fruit at all. Again, um, they talk about you're, you can do pollination with a paintbrush and pollen. Okay, if that's what you really want to do, fine. But sometimes there's not a thing you can do. You don't have pollinators in your garden, the natural ones. Um, you've got poor timing with your vines. Sometimes you have to just chalk it up to this was not a good cucumber year. And I don't know if anyone else has had that, but I've had bad cucumber years and I don't know why. It just happens sometimes. Sunburn on fruit. Um, this is where you have to have the adequate water and things like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants can get sunburned. And that's why you also want to make certain that you are not trimming leaves off and that type of thing. You want, you want leaf cover. You want to have the water proper and you just don't want it to happen. However, if it does happen, which does happen, like on my peppers, it seems every summer, you cut that part off, the, the fruit is still edible. It doesn't hurt it at all. Uh, tomato fruit set problem. Okay, if the temperature is too low, uh, before, if, you, if you're planting and the temperature drops uh, below 55, if it's too high while it's blossoming, you could have blossom drop and you're not going to get fruit set. Um, pollen, again, the pollination, if you don't have the pollinators out there, if you have too much nitrogen fertilizer, you read that box and you figure if one tablespoon is good, two will be better. No, 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 no. Those things are written by experts. As Ann said, don't do more than they say. Uh, too much shade. Maybe you planted that tomato that needs six to eight hours of sunshine somewhere it only gets one to two. It's not gonna have enough time to set fruit. It just isn't, it's, it needs the temperature. It needs all of those things to work. And heirloom's a little more difficult sometimes. I don't know why that is. And I've, I've seen that over and over. I will have five tomato plants. I decide I'm going to plant one fun one, which is an heirloom and I'll have no tomatoes at all. Maybe I might even have a lot of blossoms on it, but it just doesn't set. So you keep a journal and you decide next year, I'm not planning that one. I'm going to plant something else. And Ro, oh. one thing I just noticed we forgot to add is over watering. I was at oh. a friend's house recently and he had a huge tomato plant that was just lush. And he said, Ian, why am I not getting any fruit? You know, there's not even, you know, flowers. And I said, how often are you watering? And he said, every day. And I felt the ground and it was really wet. So too much yeah. watering. And you know, the interesting thing about heirlooms is what we don't realize is that that was the original tomato. And that's just how it was. It, it just, you know, doesn't wouldn't produce. always set. And that was why hybrids were developed because they can set a little bit better. So you know, it's good to have a variety, you know, have some heirlooms and have some hybrids. Which is fun. Yes. And the, the watering, you can just have beautiful plants, just like you said, it'll take over the whole, the whole garden, but you don't have one tomato on it. Yeah. Okay. Disorders, uh, blossom end rot, cracks, cat facing, even, even watering can, can cause the blossom end rot. Uh, the cracks, that's heat. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, in this valley, I don't know if there's been a summer when I had tomatoes that I didn't have a few that had that. You cut it off. It's still okay. And there's, like I said, there's not much you can do. And as far as the cat facing, some tomatoes automatically do that, that funny little design. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, if your family doesn't like that kind of thing, 
but it doesn't hurt the tomato at all. Okay, blossom end rot is caused by. Okay, we're going to launch our poll. What is blossom end rot caused by? Yes, where's the Jeopardy music? I know, it needs something. <laughs> All right, we've got over half people have voted. And as you can see, 83% of people put uneven watering. But a couple of people vote for other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we did not want to trick you on that one. We wanted you to realize that um, this blossom end right rot problem, a lot of times people will say it's caused by a calcium deficiency. Well, it is, but it's also caused by a calcium deficiency because of the way water is um, being distributed to the plant. So giving the plant calcium will not help the problem only changing your watering. And once a tomato already has that blossom end rot on it, that's the end for that one as far as, you know, it's not gonna magically look better if you change your practice. So just make sure to um, water your tomatoes regularly. And then, and then we go back and to what you said oh. of test your soil. You know, it's if you water too much, you can have that. If you don't water enough, you have a problem. So it's, it's Gardening, not a science. You know, it's really about experience after a while. Thank you you just yes. keep trial and error, trial yeah. and error as far because your soil type is also a big part. If you have a really clay soil, if you water once, you may not need to water again for a week. Uh, once it gets to be 100 degrees, probably a little more than that. But, um, you know, if, if you have, you have a sandy, sandy soil, soil, it just runs through. You're going to have to water more frequently, but maybe not as much. So it's, it's all about that balance. All right, Rose, so we want to encourage people to keep in touch. And um, we already mentioned the Stanislaus Sprout earlier. Um, you can um, visit our website here where you can see our upcoming classes. Uh, please find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and follow along. We announce our classes. Our next class is going to be about water and drought, and that's going to be on June 29th. So we will be announcing that pretty soon. So save the date. And we've got one more full question here, Ro. Okay, so we wanna know, what tips did you learn tonight that you plan to use in your garden? Are you going to monitor your garden? Will you choose less toxic horticultural oils or soaps? Will you try solarization or fallowing? Uh, will you use the UC IPM website or consult the master gardeners for help? We're just curious to know if we've made a difference. And this other, that one does not have um, an answer. And so while you're, um, it doesn't have a right answer, I should say, while you're answering, we wanna just encourage you to help us grow by answering poll questions that you will receive three months from now when you've completely forgotten about this class and you wonder what is this uh, survey that somebody's asking me? And that is um, a post test. So we're just trying to see, uh, does our program make a difference? And um, your help um, in answering those questions is really important to us. And it looks like a lot of people are really interested in the UCIPM website or consulting the master gardeners. A couple of folks are interested in solarizing and following wow. and in our other methods. So that's great. Yeah. Um, one more plug for the IPM website. I mean, it's great to talk to someone, <laughs> yeah. but if you go on, if you haven't used it before it and you is. go on, you it are just is. going to be amazed. Yes. And oh, now we have a yes. special guest. Yes. Uh, we want to introduce Diane Bartlett, and like I told everyone in our last presentation, this is her last time presenting because she is entering the lovely world of retirement, and which she, I'm sure, deserves hugely. So thank you, Diane, for taking time out of your evening to tell us more about books we can get 
at the Stanislaus County Library, but also on Hoopla. So anybody watching can go on Hoopla and get these books. They don't have to be local. Yes, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Ro. Uh, thanks for all the wonderful information. And as a reference librarian, that's what we're all about, right? So uh, yes, I'm here tonight to uh, mention a couple ways uh, for you to find information right from your home. Uh, you don't have to go to the library. And those ways are to use some of our apps. Hoopla is one of those apps. All you do is uh, use your App Store or Play Store and look for Hoopla. Sometimes it's listed as Hoopla for Libraries. And once you download it, it will ask you for your library card number and your PIN, which is the last four digits of your phone number. And then you can use their search bar to look for your topic. So in this case, there are so many books out there that uh, are general books that talk a little bit about um, pests and prevention uh, in your vegetable garden or your flower garden or whatever. But there are a few books that you can find on Hoopla that uh, deal just with, with pests and diseases, just like we heard tonight. So this is just a couple of titles here. Um, I don't have much to say about uh, this one in particular, the pest diseases and disorders. It, this is just a, an example of, of what you see when you uh, choose one of the titles. You'll see a little explanation. You'll see what other Hoopla uh, uh, readers have rated this. So this is not an Amazon review. This is not a professional review. It's just the other readers have have reviewed it. In this case, there hasn't been any reviews, but you will see that as well. I believe on the next slide, there are two, though, that I found in Hoopla that I wanted to talk a little bit more about. Uh, these are both British publications, but they both, believe it or not, have lots of great information that matches exactly what we were talking about tonight, or what uh, Ro and Ann were talking about tonight. So uh, these uh, both came out in um, in the last oh, 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, but as I said, they're both British. Um, the first one, the Garden Pests and Diseases, um, says that it focuses on prevention. Um, it does talk both, though, about chemical and non-chemical uh, 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 things that you can do. But what I really like about this one is that it has great color photographs and clear illustrations. So. Um, you can kind of do your research and see what maybe your problem is before you 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 uh, talk to the master gardeners. Um, and uh, the other one, the simple green pest and disease control, what I really like about this is, is that it does focus more on those natural methods. And um, it does break them down into uh, the different topics. Uh, finding those healthy plants, uh, dealing with uh, traps and barriers, and all about those natural predators that we found tonight, that we heard about tonight. It focuses more on control, not necessarily eradication, because you don't want to get rid of everything completely, just like we heard uh, about tonight. So I think on this next slide um, is our other app that we use. Again, um, you would use your app store or play store, look for cloud library and download that app, use your library card number and uh, pin to access the books here. Now there's a couple differences with cloud library. Cl the books on cloud library are purchased by the librarians at Stanislaw County Library. So if you go on our catalog, and you look for books on pest control, and you come up with, um, for example, this book here, the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pests and Disease Control. We have physical copies of this book. Uh, and uh, often you will also see an electronic download or electronic resource for some of these books. And that means that either on Hoopla or on Cloud Library, you can download these books. So if I went into the catalog today, I could see Organic Gardener's Handbook listed as a physical book, but I did not see it listed as an electronic book. 
That's because also with Cloud Library, we have access to books that are purchased by other libraries. So if you use the app, you would find Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pests and Disease Control. However, if you did that search today, you would not find that book. So what happened is when I was preparing this slide, I found this book, so made the slide, thought it was a great book. I went in today to do a little review of the book on Cloud Library, and it wasn't there anymore. And I believe that's because the books that we purchase on Cloud Library, we don't get forever, or most of these we don't have forever and ever. Depending on the publisher, we may have them for a year, a two years, 52 checkouts. Um, so it really varies. So even though this item was purchased by another library uh, and, and therefore that's how it showed up on the cloud library, the agreement is gone and it wasn't there anymore. But the point of it is look at the cloud library app, not just our catalog to find things on cloud library. And as always, you will find our information on our website, www.stanislawlibrary.org, where you can find the latest information on library services and program means and access to our catalog and how to get a library card and all that wonderful stuff. And in fact, uh, if you go on today, today is the first day of our summer reading challenge for all ages. So please enjoy your local library. And thank you so much for, for invite, inviting me tonight. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much for coming. Well, and we have a question for Diane. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks, Ro. Go all ahead. right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Diane, uh, Lisa wants to know, is there any way to download on a computer rather than by phone with an app? Yes, I've, I've done both of those today. I, I use my computer to um, access my account. So uh, just go to our library website um, under e-resources. So up at the top, it'll say about us, then there's a catalog tab, and then there's the e-resources. If you click on that, um, it doesn't, it, there's one that'll say cloud library. It says something else, but it says cloud library. And then there's one that says um, downloadable audiobooks. I think that one's the Hoopla one. And those individual uh, pages will tell you how to get your um, uh, access to those items on your computer. So yes. Uh, Diane, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but cloud library uh, cannot go on the Kindle. Is that correct? Unless you or have a Kindle, uh, unless you have a Kindle Fire, it will. Go, you you can uh, do an extra little step to get it onto a Kindle Fire. And again, if you go on our website and go into that Cloud Library page, it tells you how to do that. Because okay. I have a Kindle Fire, so I do know that one works. Great. Okay. Thanks. Good question. Thank Great questions. Thank you, Diane. And Juanita says, "Happy retirement." Thank you. I'm Look going at that to be, smile when you say that. <laughs> I I will be seeing you all as one of the attendees in, in, oh, in, in that'll be on, on your upcoming programs because I've enjoyed these over the years, both in person and uh, virtually. You guys do a fantastic job. Thank you so yeah. very much. Thank you, Thank Diane. you for being and with I, us. I have one last poll I'm going to uh, launch. It is anonymous. And of course, um, up to you if you want to take it, but it helps us with our um, data just to know a little bit more about you so we can share our outreach. And while you are taking that poll, we'll see if we have any other questions. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen so that we can um, drop a few things into the chat. Uh, we had somebody who wanted information about cockroaches. So I'm going to do UCIPM. And so, uh, you know, for a moment, um, what we could do, if folks would like, we can hop on to the UCIPM website. And you can see here in uh, real time the website all about cockroaches. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that link and paste it. 
But if you go to our the UCIPM page, it's just ipm.ucanr.edu, and I'll post that in the chat. And also, when I send out the email, I will um, post that so you can uh, visit there. And you can find, um, remember the beautiful weed gallery that uh, Ro was talking about? So you can identify your weeds. Like she was saying, some have you know different size leaves, and that can help you identify the weeds so you can better control it. And then um, this is our video library. So if you want to watch how to set a gopher trap, how to deal with ants, um, you know, aphid eating insects in action. There's a lot of action packed stuff here. Uh, we've got how to prevent mosquitoes, uh, common garden spiders. Those are some beneficial insects you might see. And um, lots of different um, videos that are really great. We've got pest notes on just over a second, Anne. I'm sorry. Yes, go oh, ahead. Um, who said this? I'm sorry. I think Catherine. Okay. Uh, can't see oh. the links you're putting on the chat. It's it might be I didn't set up. put them in the chat. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> okay, that's the one for cockroaches. Um, here is the main link for uh, home and garden pests. And, and, and for me, Anne, it, it, it's looking like the links are going to all the panelists and not uh -oh. all the panelists and That's, attendees. Okay, thank you. Okay, here we go again. Here is the main link. And then let me go back and grab cockroaches for Alan. Grab that. But just about every pest you could imagine, or at least 172 plus, we have information on them. If you can't find them here, that means um, we more than likely have a tiny blip about them. So for example, if you wanted to read about cucumber beetles, you would end up finding them under vegetables and melons. Cucumbers, you can find out what are some pests of cucumbers. Over here under invertebrates, also known as insects, you'll find a little um, bit of information about them here. And unfortunately, uh, several pests, the only thing you can do is, you know, knock them into a bucket of soapy water. Or step on them. Or step on them, which can be hard when- Yeah, uh, I, I know, but men. sometimes it's very satisfying. <laughs> Better than soapy water. No, and don't forget, we have, Let's see if I muted myself. Am I muted? No, you're not muted. We can oh, hear you. Just, oh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, don't forget, we have a lot of the pest notes already uh, at the Master Gardener at the Ag Center. So if there's You're something, if you, mm -hmm. if you don't have a printer or you want it more on a cardstock type thing, call us or let us know, this is what I want. We can put it out and come pick it up. Um, we have quite a few of them. And some mm -hmm. of them are even in Spanish. So if you have someone in the family who would rather you give that to them so they can read it in Spanish rather than in English, you know, we have some of those also. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Ro. And the other thing is that um, I will make sure there's a link in the email about where to find your local Master Gardener program. Um, we do have them in almost all 52 counties of California, so which is exciting. And again, if you're in another state, um, and so we hope we will see you on June 29th. We have uh, a class about water and drought. And uh, Vicki Salinas, our um, reference librarian taking over for Diane, will be there to um, show you some great books to use. And uh, we'll have some master gardeners to tell everybody all about it. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, end the recording here.